It gives me great pleasure to welcome to our Taiwan Expert Series, uh, Professor uh, Junyi Li, uh, who is an associate professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Nottingham. She's also director of the Taiwan Studies program there. Her books include Taiwan Business or Chinese Security Asset and the co-edited volume with Jonathan Sullivan, uh, A New Era in Democratic Taiwan, Trajectories and Turning Points in Politics and cross Strait Relations. She has more uh, work coming out soon. Uh, and uh, she's done a lot of research related to Taiwan's economic policy. And I guess, uh, you know, first I wanna welcome you to this series. Uh, uh, Professor Lee, and then uh, ask you if you would, wouldn't mind telling us about uh, your research into Taiwan's economic policy and, and maybe how your approach to this research um, has, has changed uh, over the years that you've been studying it. Thank you so very much, Professor Lisa Ray. This is my pleasure and honor to join your program. And uh, um, I would just um, share with you some of my observations and, of course, look forward if possible to hear your audience feedback afterwards. Yeah. So um, the question is to start it from the uh, Taiwan's economic policy. And uh, um, in my own research, I started of Taiwan's economic policy on outward uh, investments of the Taishan Taiwanese businessmen. And what I would like to share with you is not just about the Taiwanese businessmen in mainland China, but also in the Southeast Asian countries. So in Taiwan actually uh, started in the late 80s, Taiwanese investment started to go out, uh, especially that most of the small and medium sized enterpri enterprises they need more of the labor and they need more of the unregulated environmental restrictions. So mainland China is their natural first choice. However, at the time, actually there, are, there were also smaller number of the Taiwanese investors went to Southeast Asia, especially Vietnam. Mm -hmm. With the time growing with in the 80s, in the 90s, then 2000, Actually, Taiwanese business investment abroad uh, gradually, of course, in number and volume wise, much more in mainland. But still, there are growing number in the Southeast Asia countries for mm -hmm. two reasons. One is some of the Taishan Taiwanese businessmen, they told me that they actually do not like the political scenario in China. And uh, secondly, actually, they are they also more in line with the culture because of Vietnam and Taiwan, they have they shared a lot of the similarities there. So the, the number is still growing, but it's not that uh, um, bigger grow, if you like, uh, since the new southbound policy from President Tsai Ing-wen in 2016. And to be honest, that the new southbound policy did not just target on the business group because the uh, Thai government actually acknowledged the importance to build the relationship with the Southeast Asia countries would be on people to people's interaction that goes beyond of investment. But of course, the business is the key, right? So uh, most of the Taishan actually started and also that comes along with the cost in China in terms of the labor increased since 2010 and the environmental regulation also became stricter, stricter because Thai, uh, China has become more selective in terms of what types of investments they would accept. So the external issue or external element of Chinese China's markets or China's environments investment environment become more difficult, come along with Taiwan's encouragement of going south. That mm -hmm. actually contributes to a more successful new suspend policy compared to the first suspend policy addressed by the land president Li Deng Hui in 1996. Mm -hmm. So that is so far that I've observed of Taiwanese investment abroad. Uh, in mm -hmm. the mainland China and in Southeast Asia. You might mm -hmm. wonder uh, 
why I haven't addressed Taiwanese investment in other countries like in um, in Canada, in the UK where I am, and also perhaps in the USA. They are, but it's not in number wise comparatively lot smaller. Uh, one, um, I would say the characteristics of Taishan Taiwanese investment that from my interviewee, they might be biased because my interviewee are best in mainland or in Vietnam or in Malaysia. Um, they told me, those Taishan Taiwanese business told me that actually they are small and medium size business and they mm -hmm. want to have an easier environment to invest. The capital mm -hmm. of theirs are not that big, so they are not thinking of, you know, going to Canada or going to United States or the UK. Few of them would really go there. Most mm -hmm. majority of the Taishan Taiwanese investment go to nearby countries and easy access countries for mm -hmm. the happy, well, for the easier starting of their business. It's the limit, I understand, but it's also the actual situation. Mm -hmm. um, apart from the outbound investment, how mm -hmm. does Taiwan attract the inbound investments? Um, it's actually always a difficulty for Taiwan to attract uh, the foreign talent or retain the talents to stay in Taiwan. And when I was doing my uh, research projects of the whether Chinese investment to Taiwan is a challenging opportunity for Taiwan's industrial upgrading from mm -hmm. 2014 to 16. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a lot of the Taiwanese, uh, uh, I interviewed a lot of economic officials from the Ministry of Economy. And uh, they told me that actually the selection of foreign investment to Taiwan is very strict for uh, in Taiwan in a sense that they wanted to make sure that uh, the foreign investment to Taiwan can generate enough uh, job opportunities can generate a lot of the capital, but in many ways that also blocked a lot of the foreign investors, especially Chinese investors for security reason that you would understand Taiwan's very wary and very uh, against of the Chinese way of buying into Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So Taiwan is difficult to attract. That, that's the one of the reason of Taiwan being difficult to attract foreign investments. Mm -hmm. And another reason that uh, is Taiwan is not very easy to keep foreign talents mm -hmm. or even uh, domestic talents, if you like, mm -hmm. a big magnet of markets mm -hmm. and uh, career opportunity is cross trade China. Mm -hmm. right. So right. those are the issues of Taiwan's uh, economic developments so far. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on, on this uh, area of your research. I'm also interested in some of your ongoing research uh, that relates to Taiwan's response to COVID-19 and a possible uh, comparative project that looks at uh, how the UK has dealt with the challenge of COVID uh, and versus how Taiwan has dealt with it. Uh, you have two um, different polities in some respects, island nations uh, with different challenges maybe with respect to citizen trust in government and, and other issues. How are you approaching uh, this research and where are you at with it now? Yeah, thank you for um, asking this important question. And it's actually an ongoing research of uh, interdisciplinary research team. So on this project, I'm working with uh, Taipei Medical University. And in the UK, I'm also working with a uh, a professor from School of Business on the man uh, medical management. And mm -hmm. I also look into the digital democracy side into the projects. Mm -hmm. So um, what we just had, what we could conclude as a starting of the project as of, mm -hmm. from our conference is mm -hmm. to see why, um, how and why these two governments have a different approach to combat COVID and how does two societies in the UK and in Taiwan responded to that. Uh, we looked into the past 2020, since January 2020 till now, the UK policy, including the border control, including the check and trace, and including the vaccination. 
and mm-hmm. we also looked into the same um, key elements in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. So, of course, in a sense that UK had a very severe heat of the uh, COVID um, pandemic uh, impact on the society and the death toll is record high. And uh, we actually conclude of our so far the, the stage of the UK's public policy is to see that the peop- most of the UK people does not really actually trust the government. <laughs> they do trust, however, the NHS, National Health System, mm-hmm. is to see the vaccination actually turn the table around because from 2020 mm-hmm. March, when UK entered the first lockdown, all the policies, including the border control, including all the, um, the government's track and trace uh, system would be considered as not successful in that sense. Until January, when the government started to work with the NHS actually to start the massive and uh, systematic vaccination projects, people started to feel like this is something they can rely on. and. Uh, to this date, that is the uh, 7th of July, I could say that in, 10, in 12 days, UK will start, will open all the regulations. So far, that's what we heard from our Prime Minister. And that's because the vaccination coverage is about 70% of two doses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, in comparing to Taiwan, uh, the situation is Taiwan was a very good model of the uh, COVID control in 2020. Thanks to the border control, I would say that's the most important thing. Taiwan closed the border way earlier uh, mm-hmm. than any other country, and I would say that was the right decision. And uh, uh, then, of course, that during 2020, uh, the digital minister Audrey Tong, she promoted a lot of the digital means to uh, distribute the information and also to um, tell the citizen how to and where to uh, buy the mask, the e footprints. And of course, that we talk about the Ministry of Health and uh, the Minister Chen Shizhong. He was really. Uh, informing the citizens and uh, tell citizens not to go to a crowded area. Mm-hmm. All that was very good until this year, mid-May, that Taiwan actually entered uh, the COVID uh, impact peak time, if you like. And yeah. personally, I think it is a good reality check and it is a challenging to the Taiwanese government at all levels to mm-hmm. see how they would be able to systematically and transparently to counter this global pandemic as all the government has been encountered. And I know currently Taiwan still not out of the hook, still mm-hmm. quite in the struggling with the COVID. And mm-hmm. I think this is again, the challenging to people's trust to the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And I couldn't really put my finger on how this would you know evolve because actually both countries are still an ongoing story but i would say that it is a testimony of people's trust to the government and that trust is changing very fast Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes Uh, and i think all things considered uh even you know the recent um uh, outbreak in northern taiwan and the the lockdown, the change in regulations in Taiwan. Uh, you know, if you look at at uh, death count per capita and infection rates, you know, at a per capita level, Taiwan has still done very well in fighting COVID. So this is tremendously exciting research, and I, I'm sure I'm I'm among many who looks forward to uh, seeing it come to fruition and and learning from you going forward. So thank you for sharing that really exciting work. Um, one question I've been asking all of the Taiwan experts who are speaking in this series is, what do you see as particularly promising areas for future research uh, related to Taiwan studies broadly considered, 
uh, maybe in political science, but maybe on the edges of political science or even in other uh, related disciplines. Your own work on COVID-19 suggests the importance of multidisciplinarity in dealing with some complex problems. Just curious, uh, what do you see as promising future areas maybe for graduate students to begin to look at uh, as they choose their, their projects that may occupy them for a couple of years or even longer? Thank you. Um, it's a very important question and I often ask myself. Um, my own research changed uh, in different periods. So this is a, another sort of a crossroad of my research. I think in this sense that I would see the, I would like to, to explore more of the digital democracy. For the reason, not exactly on Taiwan. But if Taiwan's story of digital democracy can prove, we'll be able to bring divided society into more middle ground, mm -hmm. then it will be able to actually provide, I'm not saying a solution, but a, a mirroring experience for all the countries. Mm -hmm. So my hope in terms of the Taiwan study is actually not just limited in Taiwan, but what we can from Taiwan to see, we'll be able to, I'm not saying generate, but to look into all the countries in that sense, because so far in the country where I am, I see a divided society okay. after Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the hill is, it, it's the device still there, it's not healed. In, yeah. the, in the States, you name it, that's a big division. Yeah. In Taiwan as well, blue and green. Well, what, what is the answer to that? Is digital democracy, can that be an answer? I don't know. And I want to find out. So this is from, I would say, I sort of change from my economic uh, driven uh, mm -hmm. of the research um, and also IT driven because I was doing about the, uh, the, uh, the investment on the high tech industries. Now I wanted to find this answer, whether digital democracy would be able to bring other citizens into more of a middle ground. And uh, I, I would have to very honestly to confess that at this stage, I have no answer, but this is where I wanted to, you know, find the answer for the future. And it would be the holy grail, really, uh, the holy grail in sort of government studies to find um, some, some, you know, some tools for, um, you know, binding together the wounds of these democracies to helping people engage in politics more effectively than perhaps the electoral systems that we have allow people to do. Uh, there are all sorts of concerns about polarized um, politics now, particularly in democracies. Uh, yeah. So this would indeed be, <clears throat> you know, really interesting. A potential solution to improving governance, not just, of course, in Taiwan, but around the world. So how yeah. exciting uh, that uh, that's an area uh, that you are embarking on uh, future work. Um, so thanks so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank today. you. Uh, really fascinating uh, work, and I look forward to staying tuned. Um, uh, thank you Definitely. so much. Definitely. Likewise. Thank you.